Uh, Proverbs chapter 5 is our text for the morning. One of the things that you might say Solomon was an expert on, among many things, by the way, um, you know, the Bible tells us he was an uh, entomologist. He liked studying bugs. The Bible tells us that Solomon um, was a botanist and studied plant life. And there's all these dis- different disciplines and things that, that um, Solomon was uh, somewhat of a student of. But you also can say, and I say this hesitatingly, he was an expert in sexuality. And the reason we can say that is he had 700 wives, 300 concubines. Now, was that ever the Lord's plan? Was that his will? No. Solomon, by doing that, did exactly opposite of what the scriptures told him to do. In Deuteronomy, it tells us that, you know, the the Lord says, when you go into the land, your king should not multiply horses from Egypt, wives, money, silver and gold, don't multiply. And Solomon, when he did all three of those things, and he went ballistic. I mean, who marries 700 wives? Solomon. So as far as relationships and marriage and stuff, you might, you might say, well, he made a lot of mistakes. And I think that's where chapter five comes from, from a guy who kind of knows that he made some errors and there's a better way to do things, especially as it relates to human sexuality. And so Solomon's going to tell his son. Now, by the way, some people say the book of Proverbs, some people say the whole Bible's misogynistic, which it's not. It's a lie. People like to say stupid things. But Proverbs is not misogynistic. It's, if, if you just take a, a very simple look, it's, it's a book written from a father to his son. Uh, so that's why it's a lot of uh, guy stuff talking about this. And, and some people might say, well, why are they always talking about the strange woman? What's the strange woman? Why does the Bible say the strange woman? Um, well, if you remember earlier, a couple chapters ago, we talked about the evil man. Um, And that guy was to be watched out for. Watch out for the evil man. But here we're gonna learn, Solomon's saying, watch out for the strange woman. The strange woman, I'm not gonna go into it again. We covered this in detail on Wednesday a few weeks ago, but in a nutshell, it's the woman, she's called the strange woman because she's a stranger among her worldview as it relates to the children of Israel. She was a foreigner. Now remember, you know, all the women of the Midianites, the Hittites, the Jebusites, the flashlights, all the different um, Canaanite people Um, they had paganism in their brains. They were worshiping pagan deities, Ashtoreth and Moloch and Baal and these others. And and they were practicing all kinds of sexual immoral things and worshiping these gods and deities. And so those those women, which would be attractive to these young Jewish boys, the Lord said, man, you guys don't go after those women. They're strange women going in strange directions, worshiping strange gods. And so eventually even the Jewish women who started to become more of a, um, you know, an adulteress or a prostitute, she would also be called a strange woman. Even though she wasn't a stranger as, as far as foreign, she would be called a strange woman because of her behavior. That's how they sort of delineated that. And Solomon's gonna warn his son saying, man, watch out for the strange woman. She's gonna get you. And, uh, and, and really it's interesting because here in Proverbs 5, this is sort of a springboard for us to talk about something that I think is so relevant for today. One of the things I hear from time, the Bible's not relevant, but I'm, I'm here to tell you, man, the Bible is the most relevant book you're ever gonna read. It may not go with your current views. It may not be in line with our current culture, but it's still the absolute truth. When it comes to sexuality, there may not be a single topic more opposite from who we are as a culture than when the Bible deals with sexuality, the Bible is opposite of what our world is. And so just a disclaimer right at the beginning, um, what I'm about to share with you is from the Bible. If you have a problem with what I'm gonna say, you've got a problem not with me, you've got a problem with the Bible. Um, And it's your job. I'm, I'm not gonna beat you over the head with my Bible. I'm just gonna tell you what the Bible says. It's your job to say, am I gonna go with the Bible or am I gonna go with the world on this one? And the reason I say that is what I'm gonna say, some of you might even say, Brett, you're so wacko to even say the stuff you're gonna say today and you're prehistoric, antiquated, old school, uh, religious prude, whatever you wanna call me, fine. But the issue is, what does the Bible say? And that's what I'm gonna tell you. And here, in, you know, Solomon's gonna tell his son in Proverbs 5, watch out, be careful. There's a somber warning here uh, about human sexuality and the way it's supposed to be, what God originally intended for for humanity. 
Now it's interesting because in humanity, science tells us there are five drives, essential drives of the human condition. Five essential drives of the human condition. Drive number one, the, the one you'll die the fastest if you don't have this is air. You gotta breathe. Breathing is the number one drive of the human condition. Number two, water. You gotta drink. You have to drink, take in liquids and you'll die within a few days if you don't get liquids and, and you'll dehydrate and die. The third one in order is food. For some of us, we'd put that before breathing, but that's just a, <laughs> that's a debate. Um, but they say food is the next one and you gotta eat. And if you don't eat, you'll eventually starve and die. <coughs> food. The fourth one is you gotta use the restroom. Without that, you'll die. But the fifth one is one that's interesting that science includes with the top five and, and that is your sexual drive. The human drive for sexuality is essential to our existence. Um, and you say, well, how is that? Somebody could be a nun or whatever and you not have sex your whole life. Well, that's true, but if everybody did that, then we, hum, hum, humanity would cease to exist. And God built within us a, a drive, almost like the drive to eat food or the drive when you're deathly thirsty. Um, there is a drive within the human nature to uh, be sexual creatures and God created us that way. How sad it is because of the perversion of humanity, we've made sexuality such a sort of a controversial subject or a dark topic or uh, embarrassing. People blush when they talk about sexuality or whatever, some people but it really was meant to be something that God created that's part of the beauty of our existence. And not to be weird about it, but the truth is sexuality is all part of a picture of what God says, even as, as Jesus claims that his church, he's the bridegroom and the church is his bride, that we're the bride of Christ. And there's this love relationship that God has with us. And, and you say, Brett, is there any romance there? I don't know about that. Well, I think all of it is actually part of a picture of the way God created us and that we were created in his image and God wants us to see all of this as a beautiful picture. One of those pictures is the idea of faithfulness. And when it comes to sexuality, one of God's requirements would be faithfulness in marriage. You know what's amazing? With all the wacko sexual ten tendencies and trends that we see in our culture, one trend that still kind of holds true, which is amazing to me for the most part, is that if you're married to someone, you're supposed to be faithful to them. Like even in our crazy wacko culture, people still go, yeah, okay, if you get married, yeah, wedlock is a padlock. The ball and chain, man, you're locked in and you gotta be married, you can't have sex with anybody else. Well, yeah, that's true. And even our most wild of people generally say, okay, and that's why a lot of people just choose not to get married at all. Why well, get married and be the ball and chain when you can just sleep around or when you get tired of somebody, chalk them off. And see, that doesn't fit God's picture. God's picture speaks of faithfulness. And so this is what Solomon is gonna reach into and touch on when he speaks to his son here in chapter five. Let's read Proverbs chapter five and see what Solomon, the expert, has to say. In verse one, it says, my son, Attend unto my wisdom and bow thine ear to my understanding, that thou mayest regard discretion and that thy lips may keep knowledge. For the lips of a strange woman drop as a honeycomb and her mouth is smoother than oil, but her end is bitter as wormwood, sharp as a two-edged sword. Her feet go down to death. Her steps take hold on hell. Lest thou should ponder the path of life, her ways are not, or, pardon me, her ways are movable or shaky, that thou canst not know them. Hear me now, therefore, O ye children, and depart not from the words of my mouth. Remove thy way far from her, and come not near the door of her house, lest thou give thine honor to others, thy years unto the cruel, lest strangers be filled with thy wealth and thy labors be in the house of a stranger. And thou mourn at the last. And it says, when thy flesh and thy body are consumed. And say, how have I hated instruction? And my heart despised reproof. 
and have not obeyed the voice of my teachers nor inclined mine ear to them that instructed me. I was almost in all evil in the midst of the congregation and assembly. So here we see uh, the first half of this, Solomon's giving the warning, man, watch out for the, the strange woman and having this, this sexual promiscuity is the idea and, and it's, there's a price to pay and you're gonna end up saying, why did I not listen to the wisdom of my instructors? And, and he even kind of says, man, I was in the midst of the congregation, but in the most evil situation of all. And then he gives us the admonition of what to do here in the last half, verse 15. He uses sort of an analogy of drinking water, one of the main drives of human nature, but he's using the water as a, as a type of the sexual drive. Check it out, verse 15. Drink waters out of thine own cistern and running waters out of thine own well. Let thy fountains be dispersed abroad and rivers of waters in the streets. Let them be only thine own and not strangers with thee. Let thy fountain be blessed and rejoice with the wife of thy youth. Let her be as the loving hind and the pleasant roe. Let her breast satisfy thee at all times and be thou ravished always with her love. And why wilt thou, my son, be ravished with a strange woman and embrace the bosom of a stranger? For the ways of man are before the eyes of the Lord and he pondereth all his goings. His own iniquities shall take the wicked himself and he shall be holden with the cords of his sins. He shall die without instruction and in the greatness of his folly, he shall go away. Here, Solomon says, drink of the well of your own cistern. Stay with the wife of your youth. Stick with her. Don't go to the strange woman. Anything that's apart from the wife is kind of the strange woman in Solomon's chapter here. And he gives us a lot to think about. You know, it's interesting because God creates sex. God, I believe, wants us to have great sex. He's into that because he created it. But he made it, that is, sexuality, to have boundaries. Our world says whatever. In the 60s, the sexual revolution broke through all the boundaries. And, and now our culture, we, we're so far gone, the idea of a boundary sexually, well, they're just pretty much extinct. But what are the boundaries? You know, um, outside of the boundaries that God places around sexuality, I believe sexuality becomes very destructive. And in many ways, it becomes destructive. What are the boundaries of marriage? Well, that's point number one. If you're jotting down notes, number one, you can ju just put it down there. The boundary is marriage. Old school, if you got a problem with what I'm saying, you can just uh, send your complaint to, what is it, rollinghills.com. Um, no, I'm just kidding, just kidding. No, this is Athey Creek. Suddenly they get all the emails. Um, okay, it's atheycreek.com. Um, <laughs> But <laughs> the boundary is marriage. Anything sexual outside of the boundary of marriage is what the Bible calls, well, it's a fancy word in the King Jimmy. It's called fornication. Greek word in the New, New uh, Testament is porneia, where we get our word pornography. Anything outside of the boundary of marriage that's sexual is called fornication. That's pretty clear, I love how simple it is. It's simple, but it's so far from our culture that people still scratch their heads like, really? You expect everybody to abstain from sex until they're married? Well, that's what God asks you to do. That's what the Bible tells us to do. And, and, and our world says, you can't do that, that's impossible. Well, that's what they all say. But you know, as it turns out, we have amazing young people in our congregation who have chosen to say, we're gonna keep ourselves pure sexually until the day we get married. And then sexuality inside of marriage is gonna be glorious. The honeymoon is gonna be amazing. Sexuality inside of that marriage relationship was God given. The marriage bed is undefiled, the Bible says. But anything outside of that boundary of marriage is what's called sexual sin, fornication. Um, you know, some people say, but Brad, I love him. I love him and I'm gonna have sex with him. Love is not the boundary the Bible sets. Just because you love the goofball doesn't mean that you should have sex with them. Marriage is what God prescribes 
Um, and we know that from so many places. Solomon implies it here by loving the wife of your youth. But listen as I read from 1 Corinthians 6, verse 18. It says this, flee fornication. Porneia, Greek word, anything outside of marriage that's sexual. Flee every sin that a man doeth without the body, but he that commits fornication sins against his own body. Then in chapter seven is where Paul, the apostle, and by the way, the Corinth church was very American. Uh, 2,000 years ago, the Corinthians were sexually crazed, perverted people doing all kinds of crazy stuff. And so the Corinthians wrote Paul a letter, said, Paul, man, we got questions about sex, you know, what's right, what's appropriate, uh, what do we think about sexuality? And so here's what Paul writes in chapter seven of 1 Corinthians. He says, now concerning the things wherever you wrote to me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. And the word touch there means, you know, sensually. And there's a line, and most of us can kind of know where things start moving in a sensual direction. It's good for a man not to do that. It says, so nevertheless, to avoid fornication, porneia, anything that's sexually immoral, outside of marriage, sex behavior outside of marriage, let every man have his, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife, and let every woman have her own husband. Then it says, let the husband render unto the wife due benevolence, and likewise the wife also to the husband. The wife hath not power of her body, but the husband. Likewise also the husband hath not power of his own body, but the wife. Then it says something interesting about sex and marriage. It says, defraud ye not one the other. In other words, don't hold back sex in marriage, except it be with consent, unless you agree for a time that you may give yourselves to fasting and prayer and come together again, that Satan tempt you not for your incontinency. The word incontinency means your lack of sexual restraint. So what's the deal? Husbands and wives, man, they're to have intimacy, romance, sexuality in marriage is beautiful. And you're not to defraud yourselves of that in marriage unless you agree. And you should do that for the purpose of prayer and fasting. So how long should you not have intimacy together as a married couple? As long as you can fast. Last night at the, serve, the six o'clock service, uh, a guy, I said, how long can you go without fasting? And the guy yelled out, three hours. <laughs> like, I'm like, oh man, oh. <laughs> um, I was being more rhetorical uh, in that question. Um, but yeah, how long can a person go without eating? Uh, that's, the, that's the idea, that, that you're not to defraud each other in the marriage bed. It's supposed to be romantic. And sexuality is what God wants for married couples. The boundary is marriage. It's not love. It's not because you like a person or want them to feel good or like you. The boundary is marriage, and it's the key. It's, it's back to our text here at Proverbs. Look at verse 15 again, when it says, drink the waters of thine own cistern. Um, verse 17, let them be only thine own, not your strangers with thee. And then verse 18 nails it down. Let your fountain be blessed and rejoice with the wife of thy youth. It's the same thing that Paul was telling the Corinthian church. That sexuality within marriage is beautiful and enjoy each other as a married couple. That's what the, the father is trying to teach his son. Man, go with the word of God. Go with what the law of God says. By the way, in Psalm 119 verse 97 Oh, how I love thy law. It is my meditation all the day long. Why would David say that he loves the law? You know, there's very few laws that I actually love. 55 saves lives. I don't love that law. I like going fast. I like driving fast. This is the way I was born. I like speed. 55 saves that 55, I think it's dangerous. You get in everybody's way. And, um, but why would David say, I love the law? And, and, and I think it's David knew that those boundaries become a blessing. The boundaries of the law become a blessing. And, and that's what the world doesn't understand. Here's God who created you and me to work in a certain fashion. And the question is, are you gonna go with the manufacturer's specifications? That's the question. So let's pretend for a second. Let's say right after church, you do what you always do. You go to the Mercedes dealership and you choose the most expensive one on the car lot there, silver, convertible, fancy. 
And you're like, wow, this is, and you buy that car and you're like, man, I love this car. It's great, comfortable, beautiful. But you know, you kind of don't like the smell of gasoline. In fact, you actually like the smell of diesel. So when you go to the gas station, you pull your fancy Mercedes and say, forget gasoline. I'm gonna put diesel in here, I like diesel. And while I'm at it, oil's not environmentally friendly, so I'm gonna just drain the oil. Oil's not a, a beautiful substance, it's ugly. I'm gonna drain the oil out of the engine and I'm also gonna put diesel in the fuel and, uh, and it's just because I like to think my Mercedes will run better on that. And there you fire up the Mercedes and you drive three feet and all of a sudden and it dies and the engine is ruined. Why? It's because you didn't go with the manufacturer's specifications. It takes a certain kind of fuel. It takes a certain kind of mixture of oxygen and fuel and, and, and diesel's loaded up with oil. Yeah, Brett, I was gonna oil the motor with the diesel. It's gonna work out. No, nope, you didn't make the engine. It doesn't work out that way. You gotta go with the rules. Otherwise it's gonna die. In the same way, God created you and me. His beautiful creation that he made and he knows how we work and he's saying, here's how it works, monogamy. Monogamy, for those of you that were in public school, just a heads up, it's not one at a time. That, <laughs> I'm sorry. Monogamy means one partner for your whole life. Monogamy, that's what God wants. That's what God prescribes. The creator of all things said, you should be married and love the wife of your youth. Just like Solomon says, man, the boundary is marriage. And as soon as we try to move away from that, well, Brad, I'm, I'm you know, going out with this girl and she's really hot. And like, how far is too far? Too, too bad so many of our young people are asking the wrong question. Don't ask how far can you go and still be within the boundaries. Just say, man, I'm gonna just choose to be holy. And I'm not gonna cross that line. I know that sounds really, um, you know, prehistoric to try to talk about, you know, putting boundaries around yourself. But God says the boundary is marriage. It's just that simple. Now the truth is, if you do the work and study on this, you'll find that those who abstain before they're married, their marriages are richer and blessed, not only in general, but in the area of sexuality, they're the most blessed. I'll talk about that in a few minutes. One of the parents came up to me after a service, last service, and um, they, their, their child brought home their health book and they were going through the sex ed thing and the parents wisely were starting to look into what the school's you know, curriculum said, but they noticed there were a couple pages ripped out of the sex ed section. And, um, and so the parents were curious what those pages were. So they started inquiring and all the other students checked their books and they were all missing two pages out of their book. As it turns out, the, the parents really started getting curious and they, they did a little more research and they found that it was the section on how there's various safe sex options and all the you know, safe sex that they were talking about, condoms and, um, you know, and uh, uh, child uh, you know, uh, birth control and, and other you know, safe sex practices so-called. But the section that was ripped out was the section called abstinence. Uh, Lego single schools did that. Um, you know, it's interesting because that doesn't surprise me one bit because there's a huge agenda your kids are being pounded right now with an extreme agenda as far as sexuality goes, and the state of Oregon is leading the charge in the, in the craziness. And, and mom and dad, if you have kids in public school, you gotta be aware of what's going on. You really need to, you, because now they don't have to tell you anything. Your child in elementary school can wanna transition from being a boy to a girl, and they don't have to tell you that they're gonna assist them with that. Right now, there's lawsuits happening in the state of Oregon because parents are shocked when they realize the, the educators are helping and assisting kids to transition from boy to girl or girl to boy um, at the elementary school level. And I think parents are glib and naive concerning this. If, you, if you're mad at me saying, Brett, you're just making that stuff, I challenge you to look at this and ask them yourselves. We have parents that are going to school board meetings and they're stunned to hear what the curriculum actually says. And the only reason I'm waving this flag is because it's so contrary. The whole sex ed thing in the state of Oregon is so contrary to everything the Bible teaches. And you should be aware of that. You know, I always like to say, check it, see what I'm saying. I, I would say that, you know, Acts 17, 11, 
if you don't agree with what I'm saying about sexuality, search the scriptures, be uh, like the Bereans who searched the scriptures daily. Even when Paul the apostle was preaching, said, man, those Bereans, they're no more noble than the men of Thessalonica because they would search the scriptures daily to see if what, what that preacher was saying was true or false. And I challenge you to read the Bible and what is God's view of sexuality? I'm telling that to you this morning. And what is the world saying? Check that out. Don't just take my word for it. It's, it's so obscene. Some of the stuff I can't even talk about with you guys. It's where the curriculum is today. The Bible tells us the boundary in sexuality is marriage. Now here's where it gets really tough. A few years ago, the Supreme Court agreed that we're gonna redefine what marriage actually is. See, that's where we get really even more messed up because if you go with the Bible, the definition of marriage is really clear. And people get all up upset. We had a, uh, some you know, social media people lighten up about how uh, Athey Creek's not a diverse church, as it was said. But the same people were saying, yeah, and there's bunkers under that church and they're preppers readying for the, you know, none of that was true. We don't have bunkers. If you're wondering, there's no bunkers here. <laughs> Athey Creek Bunker Fellowship, you know. I, no, that's, that's ridiculous. It's funny how people love to spread rumors that aren't true. But along in that same thread was, you know, a bunch of not diverse people. But here's the thing. We had the definition of marriage before they redefined it. We're sticking with the old definition. Who defined it? God did. God says, here's what marriage is. And there's a couple scriptures. I I could give you more. I'm just giving you two of my favorites. In the very creation, in chapter two of Genesis, verse 24, God says, therefore shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave unto his wife, and they shall become one flesh. This is what God says. The very first wedding ceremony in the world, God says, here's how it's gonna go down. A man and a woman Joined together in marriage, God puts them together. Then God, when he became a man and lived among us, Jesus Christ, Jesus made it even perhaps more clear for the New Testament folks. In Mark's gospel, chapter 10, Jesus said this in verse six, he said, but from the beginning of the creation, God made them male and female. Apparently Jesus doesn't know. Jesus must, are you smarter than Jesus when you say, oh, there's more than two genders? No, nope, no, nope, Jesus said this. So you, again, you're, you're, you disagree with Jesus on this. Well, Jesus didn't have science. Jesus created the world. <laughs> um, so Jesus said, he made them from the beginning, male and female, for this cause, what cause? God made man and woman. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife. They too shall become one flesh. So when they are no more two, but one flesh. What therefore God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. Jesus is saying, man, when God puts two people together, it's not just a sexual joining, it's that. But you know, you and I, we were created by God, body, soul, spirit. That's, we're like a triune being in and of ourselves. Um, kind of interesting, we're not holy, a holy trinity like God is, but we, we find ourselves with body, soul, spirit. And I believe that when a person is married to their spouse, God supernaturally joins them. Body, that's the sexual part, that's the physical attraction part. Soul, that's your mind and your emotions. Spirit, that's the part of you that wants to seek after God and do the right thing. And God says, I'm gonna supernaturally join you together. That's why God says what, what God puts together, net, let nobody put us under. Don't rip apart what God puts together. That's why, that's why divorce is so painful. God never intended divorce. That's why God says in his word, I hate divorce. I mean, for God to say that he hates something, you kind of say, well, I guess that's a problem. If God hates something, he hates divorce. That's what the Bible says. And he says, don't let anybody divide. Now you guys know there's, there's grounds for divorce because of the hardness of men's hearts, which includes Sex outside of marriage, adultery, fornication, that that can end a marriage that God put together and it's heartbreaking and it's harmful and hurtful. And those of you that are divorced, you know know that to be true. But originally God says, one man, one woman forever, monogamy. That's my plan. That's the way I designed you. That's putting the right fuel in the tank and keeping the oil in the engine and you'll run fine for years to come. But you go against God's word and go outside of the boundaries of the Bible as far as it relates relates to sexuality, don't be shocked when things start breaking down, when things start going awry. The boundary is marriage. 
Number two, the bummer is the consequences. When you go outside of the boundaries of marriage sexually, whether you're a 12 year old, 13 year old kid playing around with sexuality in middle school, which some of you are like, are you kidding, Brett? People, yeah, you know, the Oregonian did an article on buddy sex in middle school is a big thing. The last decade, it's been a big deal. Uh, You don't even have to be a boyfriend and girlfriend today in middle school. It's cool just to sort of, you know, service each other as friends and play around. And that's what's going on. And the problem is, that's where everything starts breaking down. As soon as you move into sexuality outside of marriage, the boundaries of marriage, the bummer is the consequences that start to come along with that. By the way, whenever something's called sin, I can imagine the average worldling listening to us and saying, oh, what a, what a creep, that guy up there talking about how we can't have sex. I can imagine the world being all upset. But, but what's interesting is, you know, and, and they're saying, you're calling it sinful. I think it's beautiful. Well, here's the thing. The reason we call things sinful is not because we're looking down our self-righteous noses at you. You see, you have to understand, we all are sinners. I'm a sinner. You're a sinner. But when something's called sin, we're not just saying it's sin just to condemn and make people feel bad. We're calling it sin because it hurts you. That's what sin is by definition. You're missing the mark of what God wants for you. Just like if a person puts diesel in their Mercedes, you could call that sin because um, they're supposed to put regular fuel in there and you're gonna ruin something, you're gonna hurt it. That's why sexual sin, it's not just God, the cosmic killjoy, ruining everybody's fun. It's God saying, I made you and if you want things to work well, if you wanna be happy and blessed, go with my plan. Otherwise, it's called sin. So the bummer is the consequences when we break God's word and do our own thing. What happens when you go against the word of God? What's the cost? Well, our text tells us basically you'll be consumed. Um, Let's back up a little bit. Chapter five of Proverbs, verse eight. Let's see what Solomon says. He says in verse eight, remove your way far from her. Come not near to the door of her house lest thou give thine honor unto others and thy years be cruel. Lest strangers be filled with your wealth and thy labors be in the house of a stranger and mourn at the last when thy flesh and thy body are consumed. You'll be consumed. That's what what the Bible says. If you go against the Lord and have sex outside of marriage and practice worldly sexuality the way we celebrate sex in Portland, Oregon, What's gonna happen? There's a consuming that happens to you. Um, Notice you'll you'll see certain things here. First of all, your honor goes out the window. Second of all, your wealth. Brad, does that really apply today? I mean, is really that true? Absolutely, listen to this. Did you know that um, 80% of girls who become pregnant as teenagers, 80% of them will live below the poverty level. That's so sad for teenage girls. The the bummer is the boys don't always have the same repercussions. In fact, when it comes to sexual sin, by and large, you'll find that women are the the greatest victims. In fact, 90% of those girls that become pregnant as teenagers will never graduate or attend college. Um, But it happens to the guys too. Be sure of this, your sin will find you out. I have a, a guy that I know that got tangled up in sexual sin and adultery, and it cost him. And he, he lost 90% of his wealth just when the event happened in his life. Um, Solomon knows what he's talking about here. It will cost you, you'll be consumed. Not only your honor, your wealth, but also your health. It says that right there in verse 11, thou shalt mourn at the last when it's all said and done because when thy flesh and thy body are consumed. Hmm. What's he talking about there? Well, the truth is, from the time of ancient Canaanites, there were sexually transmitted diseases. It's funny how we call them different things over the ages. If you're from the 50s, everybody called it VD. Watch out for VD, venereal disease. Then it became STDs, now it's STIs, and they're just trying to zero in on what sexually transmitted infections. Um, But it's been a problem for years and years. The only problem is, you know, Solomon, Uh, and David, probably David also had sexually transmitted disease as he loathes himself and he says, I have a loathsome disease in my loins. That's old school Bible stuff of guys that were not 
monogamous in their relationships. Polygamy was never encouraged or approved by God. And then they wondered why they were sitting there with diseases. Some people say that some of the uh, ancient Canaanites were wiped out by the Jews, but some of them were also wiped out by their own diseases. Interesting, STDs, uh, let me give you a few more stats that are kind of interesting. Um, Did you know in the next 24 hours, 12,000 teens in America will contract an STI? In the 1950s, there, we had five STIs that we can identify, five of them. Um, now, the most conservative estimate is there's 30 today, 30. Some people say upwards of 70 STIs, and each one of those has branches of the other. For example, example HPV has 30 strains, two of which are deadly. Um, and HPV is one that um, is a sexually transmitted disease. What's interesting about HPV, by the way, just uh, giving you a little important information, while your teachers are touting condoms and safe sex, HPV, which is perhaps one of the most dangerous sexually transmitted infections, can be contracted with or without a condom. It's, it's just skin to skin touch, that's all you need. Um, no exchange of fluids, not to be too graphic, but come on, pull up, grandma's here. Grandma should have told you this. I'm doing grandma a favor, right, grandma? Like, yeah, go ahead, Brad, just tell him, please. Um, HPV is a dangerous one, especially for girls, you know, and, and the problem is, you know, with the boys, it's not as dangerous, but it can cause infertility and even death, cervical cancer, 70% of cervical cancers originate from um, sexually transmitted infections. And there's 30 strains of this, two of which are deadly and a condom doesn't protect you. So, so here's what happens. Your teachers and even well-intentioned parents, oh, daughter, you're sexually active now? Tell you what, man, you need to be on birth control. We don't want you getting pregnant. Like pregnancy is the worst of their problems. There's actually a lot of other problems. And did you know that your daughter, by putting her on um, you know, uh, birth control, she's gonna be 10 times now more likely to contract a sexually transmitted disease now that she's on birth control. Congratulations, mom. We just helped your daughter get in more danger by making it so she doesn't, she's, she doesn't worry about being pregnant. That's the statistics. Don't take my word for it, it's the truth. Look it up yourself. Meanwhile, the world sees all these diseases and problems and, and oh, how do we solve them? Well, we'll give shots and we'll do abortions and we'll do this and we'll, we'll just kind of make it all, because everybody's gonna have sex. That's what the world says. People are just gonna go crazy with sex. And uh, so we need to just, don't even mention abstinence because that, rip it out of the book because it's not even a real thing. People don't ever abstain from sex. Meanwhile, there's all kinds of repercussions. The bummer is the consequences. In 1967, when I was one year old, there were, um, if you looked at a group of high school kids, one in 32 high school kids had an STD, sexually transmitted disease or infection. By the time I was in high school in 1984, the dark ages, um, when I graduated, one in 18 kids had STDs. Today, one in four kids in high school have uh, uh, STIs of some kind. In fact, today, one in two sexually active persons in high school, one in every two people, sexually active persons will contract an STD by the age of 25. That's the World Health Organization stats. I'm getting all this stuff from the World Health. Not exactly a godly or caring institution. If you look it up, the World Health Organization is freaking out. They're saying nobody's really dealing with the rampant increase of sexually transmitted infection. I mentioned 67, 1984. In in, in 2008, a Center for Disease Control study um, released uh, estimates that one in four, uh, 26% precisely, of young women between the ages of 14 and 19, that's a pretty narrow window, One in four 14 to 19 year old girls in the United States or 3.2 million teenage girls are infected with with at least one um, of the most common STDs. Um, Interesting, today 
with more than 30 STIs, 30% of those are incurable. Back in the 50s, you get a shot of penicillin, you're good to go. Today, there are STDs that you cannot eliminate. The CDC, again, estimates that undiagnosed sexually transmitted infections cause, listen, 24,000 women a year to become infertile. Infertility to 24,000 women a year um, because of a sexually transmitted infection. And the cost of sexually transmitted infections in America are $16 billion a year. And it's no longer just VD, as they said in the 50s. It's, you know, HPV, herpes, genital warps, gonorrhea, syphilis, chlamydia, hepatitis B, hepatitis C, HIV, and there's many more we could mention. And it's dizzying, and it's a little bit freaky. So freaky, nobody wants to freak anybody out. So we give this narrative of safe sex and condoms, and even though the condom doesn't really protect you from all STDs. That's what they're teaching our kids. And they call it high risk or low risk, but it's still a risk. There's only one that is no risk. And, and that's the pages they ripped out. Abstinence, the way God says, wait, be married to one person and you'll be good to go. That's the way God made it. Yeah, but nobody's gonna do that. Okay, you're gonna break down and there's gonna be disease, there's gonna be death, there's gonna be, you know, I had a doctor last night come up to me after the service. She said, but you're right, the STDs, it's a problem. But she said, you know what? In my practice, she said, um, and she's a pediatrician, she said, in my practice, those are big problems, but she says the bigger problem that nobody's talking about, um, and I was thinking to myself, I have talked about this, but I didn't last night. But she said, the biggest problem that nobody's talking about is the psychology behind sexual behaviors of teenagers today. And she went on to tell me this really sad story how over and over girls, particularly girls come in and they were wanting to be with their boyfriend and they were, they were you know, um, trying to you know, make him happy and be the girl that he wanted and, 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 and then the next guy and the next guy. And by the time, she said, by the time they're 18, they're, they're emotionally a mess. And she said, depression is the biggest problem of sexual prom promiscuity. She said, that, that's from her professional opinion, depression is the number one problem. And she said, you know how you're reading in the papers and the news how um, suicide is at a high level now? And we all scratch our heads, man, we're at this huge level of prosperity in our nation. Man, we're all prosperous, things are amazing in America. Why are our teenagers depressed? And she said, she believes largely due to um, this open sex that kids are having and it's causing them great depression. And I believe she's right. You know, there's such a political force behind sexual issues, LGBTQ issues and what have you, but I am of the opinion the people that hate transgender people the most are the LGBTQ community. They're pushing their political agenda feverishly and they're pushing it on our kids. But let me just tell you something. I think that we care, I care more about a transgender person. Do you realize that the transgender person is being pushed by this political agenda, but meanwhile, psychology, don't, again, don't take my word for it, look this up. Psychology says, wait a minute, we, we haven't seen what really the long-term fruit of our openly embracing and even encouraging young children into transgenderism. We don't really know the full impact. And what we're doing are, while you know, Stafford Elementary across the street is encouraging and having parties of transgender switches right here. Um, meanwhile, the kids that do that, within a few years, they change their mind, but they're already giving them hormone therapy and all this stuff. And, and, and not only that, but in the transgender community, there's a 40% suicide rate in that community. Well, Brett, you're ignorant. The reason the transgender community is so suicidal, they'll say, is because of bigots like you who hate transgender people. Well, first of all, that's a total rhetorical lie. I, I really do have a heart for the gay, lesbian, transgender people that they would do the right thing and be blessed, that their lives would be blessed. But I'm telling you, the blessing comes from the Bible. Going, going God's way. God says there's things that are behaviors that are wrong and sinful and, and, and I'll tell you, Here's the reason we know that the, the transgender group is not suicidal because of 
bigoted people. Because historically there have been millions of people that have been hated, racially hated. I mean, just consider the Jews when, when uh, the Nazis um, were exterminating six million Jews. Talk about racism and hatred. It doesn't get much worse than that. They were exterminating Jews in, in ovens and gas chambers because of racism. Meanwhile, the Jewish community had a very low suicide rate during that whole thing. Even in the most horrible time of our history as a country, when we did the horrible act of slavery, the African-American community, while they were experiencing racism and bigotry against them, interesting, they weren't suicidal as it turns out. In fact, you can demonstrate throughout all of history, those that have been hated and despised, there were a lot of problems with that, but one of them was not as much suicide. And so they're trying to ascribe the transgender suicide rate when I wonder, could it be that we're just way off the course and realizing that maybe there's a better answer to help our transgender people to understand there's a better way. And I'm concerned that we as a, as a, as a culture, even some churches are jumping on the LGBTQ bandwagon, even though the Bible does not encourage that at all. The Bible says that to encourage that behavior and even to have joy in that behavior. And here we are celebrating pride and all this stuff. And those that have joy, it's an abomination to the Lord. That's what the Bible says. And, and it's not a judgmental, bigoted thing. It's just God who made us says to you and me, I want you to do well and I want you to be healthy. And I don't want you to lose your honor, your health and your wealth. I want you to be happy. Holiness leads to happiness. Jesus said, blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. People are looking for a filling sexually. They wanna be fulfilled in their sexual lives. And so we're willing to try everything except for what God says is fulfilling. And the most fulfilling sexual behavior is marriage. Man and a woman, like the Bible says. And if you want to call me bigoted, you can, but you're wrong, and I'm not a hateful person. That's just the narrative of a people who have a massive political agenda. The Bible teaches us otherwise. Man, I could go on, but basically I want to tell you, mom and dad, grandma and grandpa, times have changed, and your, your poor kids are up against it right now, and the schools are pushing as hard as ever. The state of Oregon is leading the charge. The boundary is marriage, number one. The bummer is the consequences, number two. Number three, the Bible is the best choice. Going with God's word is the best way to go. The best options, by the way, for you young people, if I've got some junior hires or high schoolers or college, man, the best choices you have are before you ever have sex to begin with. And, and I'm gonna say something that's even gonna take it to the next level if you guys are gonna think I'm really crazy on this one. But um, I had a nice young guy, he's a brave guy. He came up with his mom uh, a couple weeks ago and said, Pastor Brett, is masturbation right or wrong in the Bible? And mom was kind of like, uh, you know, tell him Brett, whatever, tell him. Um, and I get it, it's a, it's a hard topic, it's a, it's a difficult subject. But here's the thing, um, remember when I, I said um, the, the, the boundary is marriage? I know this is old school, but I wonder if even that in, in the very act of what they call self-love or masturbation, you know, where does your mind have to go to engage in that sexual activity? And would you say if you're a true, honest Bible student of what your mind is supposed to be thinking on and what you're supposed to do with things of lust and sexuality, you have to ask yourself, is, does that fit within the boundaries of marriage? Brett, are you kidding? There's, you're saying that people are even have to abstain from that? I'm not telling you have to do anything. I'm just saying, do you wanna know what the Bible says? The Bible says, keep your mind stayed upon the Lord and he will keep you in perfect peace. It tells you, tells you and me to flee, run for your life from fornication and the Greek word porneia. I mean, I think the Bible kind of gives us a clear description of what we should and shouldn't do with our minds, with our bodies, behaviorally, sexually. Marriage is the boundary. I know, old school, but biblical. Your choice to do whatever you, you wanna do if you're gonna follow the Bible or not. So all that to say, the best options are before you ever have sex, to abstain. 
to, to keep yourself for the Lord. Now, sometimes people say, Brett, kids are just gonna do it. Um, but I, I believe that humanity, God gave us, his commandments are also our enablements. He doesn't command us to do things that we cannot uh, accomplish. And, and we trust the Lord for strength, for help. And in this day and age where we're sexually uh, saturated, um, it's a hard thing in our culture to be pure and keep your mind stayed upon the Lord. But I still believe that you can do it. And the reason I know that is because there's amazing young men and women in our church that are saying, we're gonna do it God's way. And I see how the Lord blesses those young couples. I love this. I mentioned this a few weeks ago, but I, I had to dig and find that old article. Uh, I, I, I just didn't, um, didn't wanna say it wrongly, so I, I pulled it out. But th- basically the study back in 1996, so it's been a while. But the study in 1996, 1997, the, the, the United, United States spent $5 million on a study to find out who are the most sexually sat- satisfied people in America. That's $5 million uh, to study. Uh, USC, uh, University of Boston, Chicago, all those schools were participating in this uh, $5 million study. But when the study came out, everybody was stunned. Rolling Stone magazine freaked out. Matt Lauer on, on the Today Show was stunned. And he's the one who first announced it. He said, man, the study found, and this is what he said, guess who's having the best sex in America? Christian married monogamous women. <laughs> yeah, the lady's like, amen. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And Rolling Stone magazine said, revenge of the church ladies. <laughs> That's what they said, it's a true story. Um, isn't it, it shouldn't shock us that sexually satisfied people are the ones that are doing it God's way to keep your bodies pure and set aside for marriage is an old school, you know, laughed at, scoffed, mocked behavior. Meanwhile, while they're all laughing at us, they're trying to figure out how to deal with their STDs and abortion, and they're trying to figure out why everybody's depressed and suicidal, and they're just saying, yeah, stop talking about purity and abstinence. We're gonna have sex no matter what. And they keep feeding that monster, and the further our culture goes down to sexual perversion, the more miserable we're gonna be. It's just the way the Bible tells it. And, and it's clear. So the fourth and final segment of this, I'm gonna call the battle continues to keep my little alliterations going. The boundary is marriage. The bummer is the, the consequences. The Bible is the best choice, but the battle continues. Once you're married, the battle continues. There's this notion that, okay, Brad, I'm gonna abstain. And then the young couple says, I'm gonna be pure. And this is a battle but man, I can't wait to get married. Suddenly I'll be free. Like some little pixie comes and sprinkles discipline dust on you as you say, I do. Oh, no more lustful temptation in your life. But that's not the case. The battle continues. In fact, maybe even worse, because Satan knows if he can split a family and divide a marriage, mission accomplished. Satan wants to mess up the marriages. And so no wonder there's all lustful things and there's, there's temptations on every side. But that's why Solomon says here, man, stay with the the love of your youth, the woman, the the wife of your youth. And and the Bible's pretty graphic here when it says, let her breasts satisfy you, not the breasts of a strange woman. Like like this is pretty pointed uh, information. You're kind of like, man, Brett, can we just kind of move on? But I don't think the Bible wants us to move on. It wants us to say, stand firm, keep fighting the fight. After you're married, keep your, your guard up because the enemy's gonna want to continue. This is where the world, by the way, falls so short. While the world still agrees that you should be faithful in a marriage situation and adultery is still bad, but at the same time, they're saying, kids are just gonna have sex. They can't control themselves. What, what, what do they believe makes a marriage suddenly doable and kids that just can't control themselves are gonna have sex. What, what changes? The answer, nothing changes. The world is wrong on this one. You're not sprinkled with discipline dust once you're married. You're still gonna be tempted. And that's why there's all kinds of adulterous affairs and all kinds of sc- scandal and problems everywhere because the world refuses to acknowledge that the same strength you need to abstain before marriage 
is the same strength you're gonna need to be committed and faithful in your current marriage. They don't wanna admit that, but it's the absolute truth. It takes the same fortitude to be pure and to be godly. The world doesn't wanna acknowledge that. The Bible is clear that the battle's gonna continue, that we're to run from fornication, run for your life. Don't let it be any part of you. The behavior is clear, that's what we're supposed to do, flee fornication. I'm not saying this to be a heavy preacher. You sound like a preacher today, Brett. That's what I do. Don't forget, it's my job description. But I also am not afraid to speak this to you because the world is pushing back so hard right now. And mom and dad, I think it's time to wake up. Grandma and grandpa got to chip in. And we got to talk to our kids a lot earlier than you think we have to tell. Oh, Brett, our kids are like turning 18. Is it time to have the talk? (laughs) It's like, are you kidding me? They had that talk in first grade with their buddies on the playground and they got the wrong information. Uh, and they see it on their shows and their movies and all the sexual in- innuendo and all that stuff. It's rampant, it's feverish. And unless you're doing your job, mom and dad, don't be shocked when your kids go down the wrong road. Because the, the, the ed- education curriculum in Oregon is pulling your kids as hard as they know how. And they're doing it in a sneaky, devilish kind of way. I'm just telling you the truth. May the Lord give us ears to hear and may the Lord give us wisdom to know how to live our lives as Christians in these dark days and and to realize that it's not a, a bummer. When the Lord commands us to be pure, it's not for bummer, it's for blessing. Um, God wants people to have good sexual relationships. He invented it, he made it within the boundaries of marriage and God will bless that incredibly. Don't be ripped off by the enemy. Don't be ripped off by the Oregon State education. Don't be ripped off by the political agenda of so many cramming stuff down our throats and beating us over the head into submission to believe that their way is better. If you wanna know what the Bible says, I just gave it to you. Biblical sex ed 101, right there. That's what it was. May the Lord give us ears to hear what the Spirit says to the church in Jesus' name. Let's pray. Lord, I I pray that you'd open our minds and our hearts to your word. Where we've just dismissed your word as out of date or ill-informed, forgive us, Lord. No doubt, Lord, some people even who've walked out even of this service maybe are angry and are getting ready to go blog it up and say stuff. Lord, I pray that somehow you just tap them in their hearts and let them know that what we're talking about here is so true. And that, that this current sexuality that we celebrate in our culture is so flawed and so harmful and psychologically damaging so many people and so many people hurt and depressed and lost and sick. But how thankful I am, Lord, that you give us your word. I'm also thankful, Lord, that for many of us, all of us in this room, we've all fallen short. We all have sinned. None of us are better than anybody else. And Lord, for those that have been divorced or had sex outside of marriage or abortion or any of these repercussions of our own sinfulness, Lord, I'm so thankful for that mercy, that you're a merciful God. And you take our sins, as ugly as they are, and you're able to make them go away. You tell us you put our sin as far as the east is from the west. You remember our sins no more. That song we sang earlier, Lord, I'm so thankful that your mercy is for me. And that you give us your mercy, not just barely, not just sparingly, but your mercy endures forever. How thankful I am for that. So rather than condemnation, Lord, I pray that we'd find our hearts convicted, convicted of sin that we might turn and walk in your truth. Lord, be with our young people in this church because the pressure is feverish. The agenda is massive. Lord, guard the hearts of our kids. May they outsmart the lunacy of the sexuality of our current culture. May they go with your word. Just put it on their hearts, Lord, to do what your word says. We pray blessing on our young people from high school, college, middle school, even the little guys, Lord, put a hedge of protection around them, we pray. We ask this, Lord, knowing you've heard our prayer, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen, let's stand together.
told you I was rated M. <laughs> um, but man, don't be afraid to, I think we as Christians have cowered on this topic. We're afraid to talk about stuff like this. And because of that, the other side is getting away with murder, literally. When it comes to abortion, when it comes to sexually transmitted diseases that really do cause trouble, um, the world is just pushing their agenda and Christians are like, don't say anything. People will hate you, they'll call you names. I think we as Christians should lovingly say, if you wanna know what the Bible says, here's what it says, and not back down from that. So may the Lord give you boldness to be a biblical being following the Lord in Jesus' name. We'll see you next time. You're dismissed.